Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. And folks, we got John Hamer back. Uh, man, I'll tell you, John, we got I've been getting really good responses from people from our first uh, uh, segment that we did, which covered, and folks, if you haven't, um, of course, watch this episode. You don't have to necessarily watch them in chronological order, but when you're done watching this episode, go back and watch our episode that covers from basically the first vision up to the formation of the church. And now we're going from the beginnings of the church uh, there, this one is going to all the way up to 1844. And then our third segment is going to be the period of time from 1844 to 1860. And then I just, just was talking to John and we're going to have him come back in a few months. And we're going to then cover the history of the RLDS and community of Christ, which you of course are a member of and a minister in, uh, from, from 1860 to the present day. So this is a great project. Uh, John, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy that um, people have been enjoying the first conversation we had in this uh, series that you're doing. And um, because I just enjoyed uh, talking to you so much. And so, uh, yeah, I hope I'm glad people are enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just really cool. I was just off camera. I was telling you some of the comments I was getting and uh, you had mentioned, well, it's pretty good. You're getting compliments from some of those people. So that's cool. So um, <laughs> here we are. We uh, just ended up in our last episode. We ended up with the formation of the church in uh, uh, in, in 1830. Now, this is the thing, folks, as an evangelical, what I try to do is not just talk about the history chronologically and everything like that, which is important, and I, I really like that, but also I like to uh, put in there some aspects as an outsider, because the early days of the church are very, very familiar to me, and uh, so I think what we want to talk about is the early days of the church. Essentially, what we had was we had a group of people who were um, products of the Second Great Awakening, uh, yes. They were of a Protestant orientation in general. Uh, many believed in the idea of the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit were relevant for the day. And uh, so this is this is early on. They get together, they form a church, and let's just start there, John. Yeah. Well, so even before they form a church, they've been doing exercising some of those gifts of the Spirit, like you say. And so, in fact, um, they, uh, you know, they start to think of them in terms of they are... Um, they're Christian primitivists, and by that we mean that they are interested in um, experiencing what the, what we don't use the word primitive this way anymore, but anyway, what the primitive church by which they mean the church that is, uh, is as they read about it in the book of Acts. So um, I would actually say that um, I'm kind of a historical minimalist. I don't think that there's much in Acts that is actually historical, but they read it as literalists and they thought that that was stuff that actually, um, you know, actually happened. And so they wanted to live exactly as the, uh, as the primitive church lived, the church of the apostles, essentially. And so, um, and so as, um, as primitivists who wanted to restore, you know, that, that's where they get this idea of being restorationists, to restore that primitive church that they read about in Acts, um, they initially um, only want to do things that effectively are found in the New Testament. And, uh, and then also because they have this additional layer of, um, of a, a new scripture, so New, new Testament, and also then, of course, uh, the Book of Mormon. And then also they have a new layer of, uh, of other kinds of spiritual gifts. So Joseph Smith is also dictating um, you know, new revelations. In other words, they also have uh, scripture that they're living themselves. And, and they really do feel like they are almost living the book of Acts. And when they, um, and one of the early members is uh, named John Whitmer, part of the Whitmer family is one of the witnesses of the plates, uh, eight witnesses, uh, which is to say that he hefted them in the box and so forth. Um, uh, he is called to be the first historian of the church right away. And, and, and as such, he starts writing almost like a Book of Mormon style thing. And it came to pass that we did this. And, you know, and so in other words, it's almost written in that same kind of um, Book of Mormon-esque, King James-esque language, as they themselves now are, uh, are considering themselves essentially the restored church and trying to live out scripture. Um, and so that's certainly where they're at right away. And so at the very beginning, um, a lot of the things that, you know, the movement eventually evolves into by the end of this lecture that we're not lecture, this period, this conversation we're having right now, which is going to take us 1830 to 1844, everything that exists in 1844 hardly exists at all in 1830, you know, and so the entire organizational structure or priesthood structure of the church then in April 6, 1830 is that they have elders, uh, uh, priests and teachers. 
and that's it. And they understand uh, that the elders are also apostles. And so, so they um, have read about there being elders and priests and teachers in uh, the New Testament. Those are, you know, kind of what they, they consider to be offices. But anyway, they, those are titles that people in the New Testament have in King James version of the, of the New Testament. And so, um, and so they only have those. And, they, and specifically, the, the leading ministers are the elders who are sent off you know, just like in, uh, in Luke, you know, with the apostles and then the 70 uh, that follow after sent off in twos in order to, um, in order to pre preach the, you know, the coming of the restored gospel and so on. Yeah, and, and I want to get into this because obviously um, during this time, we have what is called the restoration, but it's within a broader context. So maybe we could talk a little bit about Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell, the Campbellite Stone, Stone Campbellite right. movement. Um, and just, I'll give a little background on it just because, um, well, first of all, we have Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone. They were two ministers who started kind of simultaneously this idea of going back, like you said, to the first century of primitive types church. I think one was a Presbyterian, yep. one had a Baptist background, if I'm not mistaken. And so they were come from the traditional Protestant background, but they felt that they needed to go back to the way things were and that's so this idea of like they, they didn't really like the idea of all these uh creeds and the nicene stuff and they even yep. came, came up with the term uh, deeds not creeds you know that kind yeah. of thing and right. so you have this movement that's very very influential and you even have like alexander campbell he comes up with a bible he has his own translation of the bible uh it's john the immerser not john the baptist you know he they're making some very strong theological views about how they yeah. see things were early on so this was like very influential movement and just so you know the modern uh you know, so and there's there's a reason why the original name of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints wasn't that, but it was the Church of Christ. That's so right. in America we have the Church of Christ, Churches of Christ, Christian Church, and uh, and then Disciples of Christ. These all come out of a Protestant Restorationist movement, and right. so this is highly influential. This is part of the the world that Joseph was in. Is uh, anything you want to add to that summation? Yeah, you know, no, no, you're exactly right. And so, so when I just described um, their desire to be Christian primitivists and try to do this thing by by living the New Testament, they are not alone in doing that. So, as you say, there is our very influential thinkers, Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, and, and so on, and many more, who are who are advocating something very similar. And their goal, there's a couple goals in doing it. So, so this is built on, you know, nowadays, especially in the. Um, in the LDS church, they, they <clears throat> would like to imagine that they're not anything to do with Protestantism. It is all entirely rooted in Protestantism. And it's even, it's even Protestantism, um, you know, taken to another -er level now, you know what I mean? And so, so the Protestants um, already in, in breaking from, uh, Protestantism comes out of the Western church, so the Latin church, uh, what we now think of as the Catholic church, although Catholic just means the universal church, but anyway, the Latin church. And um, and, and so in breaking from uh, uh, the, the church, the rest of the church, um, they, they decided to, uh, to scuttle a bunch of things that were, were deemed to have been, let's say, um, deviations from original Christianity as the church through history um, essentially adopted, let's say, pagan practices and things like that. And so, and so a, a serious goal of uh, Protestantism, Protestantism already was to get rid of the other other sources of authority in the church, which were tradition, um, the uh, the church uh, fathers, uh, and uh, apostolic succession, and instead rest everything solely on scripture. And so now, and, and so and they and it happened, and it's no coincidence that happens because of the invention of the printing press, and now people have access to scriptures. And so now um, this is taken. So they've already done that. Protestants have already done that and been purging all kinds of stuff out of Christianity. So in the Middle Ages, the, the primary way Christianity is even uh, the focus of the religion is and monks and nuns you know that's gone from protestantism all of that kind of stuff now it's going to be bible study and, and preaching sermons and so forth um and so now for the primitivists they're going to take it one step further so now they're they've already accepted that the bible and scripture is a source of authoritative answers to questions and stuff like that but they're going to get rid of other things that they even think have crept in so like you say creeds uh they only want things that are in there that are written in there in the text and so on and so this is a common idea 
And then one of the goals of it, again, and Alexander Campbell's very stated goal, and it's also Joseph Smith's goal, is if only we could all do this, then uh, and we, would, we would no longer have a church that's called the Lutheran Church, or a church that's called the Presbyterian Church, or a church that's called the Methodist Church. We'd have a church all together that is called what the Bible calls it, like the Church of Christ or the Church of God or something like that. And so they want to have a, or the Christian Church. And so they want to have a name like that. And so they, and so the, and so in the same exact way, the church that Joseph Smith and the other early members organize uh, in 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 Palmyra, and also actually not actually in Palmyra, and they do it probably Fayette, uh, in 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 um, or whichever place. Actually, they're in Palmyra, not Fayette. Anyway, it's it's, it's got they got it wrong in the dates. It doesn't really matter. In upstate New York, <laughs> you know. Um, when, uh, when they do that, they're part of something, they're doing exactly the same thing everybody else is doing. The difference is that they, um, they also have a new book of scripture that is providing a new authoritative answers. And then in the course of doing that, uh, Joseph Smith has not only channeled the, the text of the Book of Mormon, but he's also text channeling um, uh, the prophetic voice. So he's also saying, thus saith the Lord, and the people are getting uh, individually tailored what they originally call commandments. Um, but ultimately they think of as, as covenants or revelations, or as we say, inspired counsel. Yeah. So it's, it's so interesting folks. And, you know, just to kind of give a little outsider perspective on this too. Now, for instance, uh, within the churches, okay. So it's kind of confusing, but you, they don't like to call themselves denominations. They call church of Christ, churches of Christ, Christian church. All of them are kind of rooted in the same family. Some are friends with the others, others fellowship less than others, but you actually, within the churches of Christ movement, you have instrumental churches of christ and you have non-instrumental churches of christ well why is that well because it's not <laughs> instrumental people say well first of all there are no instruments used in the new testament church in the scripture right. so that's why they don't do that so that's that just gives you an example of how they wanted to really oh, yeah. try to replicate the early days of the church oh yeah and and so and then those things get really like you say very focused you get very focused on them in the in the in this congregation in the in the uh in the 1960s, and actually all across the RLDS church, there's no dancing. So dancing was, you know, dancing is a slippery slope. You know, dancing leads to card playing, which leads to, you know, drinking, which leads to revelry, which leads to murder. <laughs> you know, in other words, <laughs> you know, it's literally, we got a chart of that, you know? Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. so that was definitely kind of part of the system, you know, and so on. So this early, this, these, this early little church, the one really, um, kind of remarkable thing that they accomplished, uh, they have been trying to accomplish is to bring this new gospel, the Book of Mormon to the Native Americans. And the Native Americans simultaneously at this very moment in 1830, uh, the Indian Removal Act is, uh, is causing, the US federal government is causing all of the natives who still live east of the Mississippi River to be forcibly relocated beyond the permanent Indian frontier. And so the, essentially the Kansas, what's now the Kansas-Missouri border. And then this becomes an area of real focus for the movement. So the Indians are being forcibly removed there and the movement sends what's called the Lamanite missionaries with a bunch of Book of Mormons to go and preach to Native Americans and specifically to go preach to them uh, in what's now Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, and so that's uh, kind of an early focus and it's, it's hard for this little tiny church to do that, but that's kind of a, you know, it's a big long uh, trek that they take and that's what they uh, kind of initially try to do. Yeah, it's really interesting folks how that really was the key thing was that this really, this message was really primarily for what they considered the Lamanites, right? Yes. And, yeah. and, that, and that was really important. And then it was gonna usher in like some kind of end time scenario of them realizing their true history and, it's just a fascinating story about you know how white people viewed Native Americans, and we've 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 touched on this before, and and then how they viewed them, and then you know in one sense one of the things I have to say is that you know there was a very negative stereotype of Native Americans that many white people had, and at least to yes. its credit, there was an attempt to say that within a white perspective, because again this still yeah. there's, there's a lot of racism going on, yeah, but they were trying course. to they were looking at them as being chosen people. Yes. You know? And I think that's an important thing that they brought to the table that was unique uh, in some ways uh, that they, they didn't have just an immediately negative view that they thought that there was some, some, some value there. And of course, I don't want to get too deep into that, but it's just an interesting thing about the history. So, uh, so we, we're, we're, moving, we're in the New York period. Now, let me ask you a question. Why is it that Joseph Smith decided 
that they were going to uh, uh, do something different and not stay in New York where the church was established, but they end up finding themselves in a uh, in another place. Now, this is what's so interesting is that, uh, you know, the idea was is that the idea that you had Hill Kimura in upstate New York was like a centra central location. And it's just interesting how um, very early on within this story of the church, we actually have them uh, heading, uh, starting to head uh, west. Uh, what would be the impetus for that? Um, well, so, so even, so, so why do they go west? So part of it is that um, even though they went to go preach to the Indians, um, like you say, the Book of Mormon is still from the settler perspective. It's still from the white people perspective. And so the Indians that they preach to do not hear themselves in this story. And so it doesn't actually speak to them the way that was hoped to speak to them, right? But it does speak to all of the <laughs> other settlers. And so as the missionaries kind of make their way across uh, the country, they, um, one of the key people that they end up uh, um, converting is uh, is a guy named uh, Sidney Rigdon. And Sidney Rigdon is the leader of a Campbellite, a series of Campbellite congregations in Northeastern Ohio in what's called the Connecticut Reserve of Ohio, so a little east of Cleveland. Um, and suddenly now um, that, uh, that this guy and his congregations convert, suddenly the entire uh, gravity of this movement now shifts. So the couple little scraggly branches that exist in, in New York or nothing, because now there is an actual established uh, set of uh, essentially churches and people who are already trying to uh, live kind of communitarian um, uh, primitivist experiments in Ohio together and so on. And so it doesn't take very long for uh, uh, Joseph Smith and other people who are in New York to decide that they really should gather uh, to um, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah, and so we end up now in a place called Kirtland, Ohio, and we end up with a gentleman named Sidney Rigdon, who we, of course, we've already talked about that church background of that movement. Now, Sidney was an important person within this movement, uh, yeah. was known uh, by all the major players, and, you know, he was one of the players in that movement. And just so, real quick, so he, he converted, he got a copy of the Book of Mormon, and he converted, and then roughly how many people from his congregation converted? Well, so many, many more people in his congregations, you know, were already, you know, joined in than what Joseph Smith had in his right. side, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so I'll just like, just some of the people who were already members of uh, Sidney Rigdon's church were Frederick G. Williams, Edward Partridge, Newell K. Whitney, Lyman White, Harley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, Orson Hyde, John Murdoch, Isaac Morley. In other words, these are all of these early leaders. They were, they came from Sidney Rigdon, <laughs> you know, you know, the only people that are, you know, from Joseph Smith's side of that are people like, uh, Oliver Cowdery, the Whitmers, Martin Harris, and then Thomas B. Marsh had joined. So he's, but anyway, in general, in general, the, 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 the large grouping here of important people are coming from Sidney Rigdon's side of this. And so uh, actually because of the importance of this, um, Steve Shields, who's one of the historians of uh, uh, the movement and who is a member also of Community of Christ, he's, um, he, uh, he describes the movement, he thinks the movement should be called the Smith-Rigdon movement uh, because of Sidney Rigdon's importance as essentially a second founder of the movement. Yes, yes, I was going to bring that up. That that that, that is the important as important of a role that Sneer Reagan played. And of course, he plays yeah. an important role all through this period of time that we're going to be discussing. Um, yeah. So, you know, you have early on in the process, you you we are also seeing, of course, we talk about the gifts of the spirit. We also talk about um, the, their operational. Now we can we'll talk briefly, maybe just about Black Pete and the movement that was going on within the context of uh, manifestation of gifts at this time before Joseph Smith arrived to Kirtland. Maybe just touch on that a little bit. Well, yeah. So, um, so they already. So yeah, like you say, there's there's um, maybe a, there's new things that are happening, right? So so on the one hand, they're they're both primitivist movements. The one has been um, you know associated, like you say, with the Campbellites, and the other one is you know uh, has these uh, interesting things about the Book of Mormon and so forth, right? Uh, but the one that is happening in, that, that Rigdon has already had, one of the things that kind of has been happening is that they are also, um, they're way more uh, likely, for example, to be speaking in tongues. 
um, they're they're experiencing some more of that kind of Pentecostal stuff. They are um, they've gotten together on a farm together where they're holding all things in common in some of the cases, and so they're trying. Which is one of the things that's, that the church does in Acts, right? And so they read about this in the Book of Acts, uh, you know, where um, essentially it says that. Uh, there's no poor among them because you know they had all things in common and whatever anybody had they sold and get brought it at the feet of the apostles and so forth and it was distributed you know to everybody who had need or whatever right and so and so it, people keep trying to do that it's really tough to do that <laughs> you know and usually those experiments um you know don't work and so like there's like a there's a great story i don't remember who, who I don't remember who said it or whatever, but essentially um, they were living together in this kind of community. And then somebody who was in the community came and grabbed one of the people's watch and took it away and sold it. And, uh, and, and the person said, what did you do to my, my watch? He says, oh, I thought we all shared everything in common. I thought it was all in the family, you know? And so, so they do have that kind of a thing going. Um, and that's initially kind of as the movement merges together, some of that stuff is kind of weeded out as it's as it, as uh, Joseph Smith and some of the other people are less comfortable with it, right? And so there's kind of some of early um, some early experimentation with that, but you know there's continues to be some of that kind of Pentecostal and speaking from the Spirit, and that that continues. Um, into the reorganization tradition, we've had that all the way down to people in my congregation, um, you know, remember that, especially as even happening in their lifetimes, certainly at our, um, our camping tradition. So like, especially, or, or on some of our, um, when we would have prayer services or testimony services. And so, and so, and so in that sense, you know, when, when, when I was talking to you before about this idea of Joseph Smith recovering the prophetic voice and, and, and giving these individualized bits of revelation or commandments, this is not that different from what um, uh, uh, Pentecostal might experience when people are speaking in the spirit, right? Because you might receive a revelation on somebody's behalf and you might have that in tongues and then there's an interpretation thereof. And so it is a little different because it's formalized at a certain point because there's one prophet for the church that is kind of receiving these. But um, in some sense, it's not that different of a gift of the spirit than other people experience. So basically, um, we have Joseph Smith arriving on the scene in Kirtland, Ohio. He appears at a, the Whitney store and introduces himself to a gentleman and says that you have prayed me here. I yeah. am the prophet. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, so... Um, like I say, there's a bunch of these uh, people who had been uh, uh, Sydney Rigdon's uh, in Sydney Rigdon's community, and one of those is Neil K. Whitney. And so, uh, one of the um, one of the interesting things that I think that about Joseph Smith uh, was he's very flexible and was also very able to um, include uh, new ideas and new people in his structure. So by the time we get to the end of this. Um, period, you know, at the end of this chat today in 1844, he gathers everything up to himself and he has, he's got all the titles and he's in charge of everything. Um, that is not initially the case, you know, in the, the way the church emerges. You know, he initially starts out as just the first elder of the church. He later does keep, you know, like some of the, as different titles emerge, he, he has the, the top title, like, and, and so forth. But a lot of times there will be, um, uh, 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 people like Newell K. Whitney here for whom um, uh, they, they, he, he'll establish or restore a new title. And so one of the things is, is that's, that you can read about in the New Testament as a title is bishop uh, or in early Christianity. And so then um, at a certain point, Joseph Smith uh, restores that office of bishop to the church and gives it a particular restoration bent to it. And so it means something quite different um, that it means in the whole rest of Christianity, Bishop, in, in the Restoration tradition, because it, what it means is financial officer. And so it means a person, so as we're talking about having all things in common and doing communitarian things together, uh, the bishops are set aside to be in charge of temporal things. And so, um, and who does he pick to have to be the bishops are uh, you know, Edward Partridge and okay, Whitney, the people who actually have money in stores, <laughs> you know, and so essentially then that intermixes kind of the, the handful of wealthy people that he has that are backers. They are now kind of in charge of like 
uh, distributing stuff to the, the rest of the poor in the church. And so it just shows kind of like a, a flexibility of adding to the structure, which changes remarkably from that structure in, in 1830 that had the, only the three offices. When, by the time we get to the middle of the Kirtland period, 1835, there's, there's, there's a crazy structure has emerged that's so elaborate for such a little church, you know, that uh, there's two orders of priesthood. There's the Melchizedek priesthood, there's the Aaronic priesthood. There is a presidency of the high priesthood, which is the Melchizedek priesthood, which is then the first presidency. There's a presiding patriarch evangelist. There are other patriarch evangelists. There is a high council of, of Kirtland. There is a high council of Zion, which is to say Missouri. There is a traveling high council of the 12 apostles. There's seven presidents of the councils of 70. There are pastors who are the presiding elders of the different branches. And there's still elders, teachers, but now there's deacons and, and high priests and so forth. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's hard to keep track of all of that, I'll tell you. You know, I guess what we could talk a little bit about is the fact that, you know, this is, like we talked earlier, this is the Smith Rigdon movement. So let's talk a little bit about the dynamic of Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith and what they ended up starting to, I mean, what they ended up building. So, so when Sidney Rigdon joins, um, he immediately starts to displace Oliver Cowdery now as Joseph Smith's um, major collaborator. And so, um, and, and because Sidney Rigdon has like a lot of um, experience and skills that Joseph Smith doesn't have. So he has already been a leader in the Campbellite movement. He is a very skilled orator and preacher. Joseph Smith has more or less just been kind of a fair exhorter, he was called, and so on. And so um, Sidney Rigdon becomes kind of the spokesman for the movement in, 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 uh, in the preaching component of it. Um, he also is interested in things like these communitarian experiments like they were doing uh, in Kirtland before uh, Joseph Smith got there. And so there continues to be... Um, uh, within the movement now, goals of, let's say, having agricultural co-ops together, of, of pooling uh, property in order to build Zion up and, and be able to uh, uh, have no poor among you, in other words, doing social stuff together in that way. Um, and then other things that, um, that Sidney Rigdon is interested in uh, that probably influences um, Joseph Smith, now that he has, um, uh, now that we have this gift of the spirit that includes essentially channeling uh, the prophetic voice that included the um, channeling the plates to get in order to get the Book of Mormon text. Um, Sidney Rigdon wants to, um, he believes that the, the Bible, you know, hasn't been um, uh, translated properly. In other words, there have been errors that have been introduced by the monks who have been copying it and so forth. And maybe even there's deliberate errors that have been made by the uh, apostate church or something like that. And so now with this gift of the spirit, they want to, you know, begin a project of, of retranslating the Bible or of correcting the Bible. And so Sidney Rigdon is also much more of a Bible scholar than Joseph Smith has. And so he is part of that, um, that kind of group that's working with Joseph Smith on a Bible revision project. Oh, that's very interesting. So how much of an influence did Sydney have on that project of the what would be eventually be called the inspired version or this Joseph Smith translation. Yeah, so I um, so I would think at this point that um, that 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 would be very well known, and you probably should talk to some of the uh, the Joseph Smith papers folks on on exactly what the level of it is. My my feeling with Joseph with that it's like when people ask, well, how much did Oliver Cowdery's input into the text of the Book of Mormon? My feeling about Joseph Smith is that he is a um, He's very flexible. He likes to bounce ideas off of people. Um, people might have had ideas, and they and then they become Joseph Smith's ideas pretty fast. <laughs> so I so I would think that you can, it might be very hard to tell exactly where an idea initially comes from, but Joseph Smith will clamp onto it, and it'll be part, become part of the thing pretty fast. So I would think it's it's um, at this point Sidney Rigdon is exerting a lot of influence. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah yeah. So so this is a very much you know. Uh, influenced by this particular movement. Of course, folks were just talking like from a naturalistic perspective, you know, a, a historical naturalistic perspective, people who believe in the supernatural, of course, we just want to talk about these things on that level so that you get a broader understanding of what the scholarly consensus is on a lot of this stuff as well. And then just go, to, and it's just very useful information to help with that narrative of trying to understand the historical aspects where it does also uh, intertwine with the supernatural, with the spiritual as well. And then you make up your mind, uh, how much is 
influence in the other and vice versa. Um, you know, I just, if, I want to continue on and I just, I just, one little quick thing. Um, I'm in Kirtland, Ohio, and I'm going to walk into the doors to a Sunday service for, for the Church of, Church of Christ, right? And Sidney Rigdon, this, you know, is given the sermon. What kind of sermon, how long does it last and what, what, what would all be in this uh, Sidney Rigdon sermon? Well, okay, so one, they don't have a church. Right. <laughs> so, so, so the very first, um, the very first building that the church builds is Kirtland Temple. So they don't actually have uh, a church. Okay. And, and in fact, Kirtland Temple, it, if you look at a picture of it, it looks like a little church, but actually it's because it's actually a lot bigger. <laughs> it's very, it, so they scaled it up because they really had no experience building at all. Uh, before they did it, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, they didn't know how to make a foundation properly for it, actually. <laughs> we had, we've had to fix it a lot <laughs> in order to save it. Um, but, but, um, uh, but anyway, so, so, but yeah, what would, the, what would it be exactly like? It is so hard to recover um, the lived church experience, but we definitely know that, um, uh, you know, like if Sidney Rigdon is giving a sermon, um, you know, it, 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 it could go on for hours, you know, and so the way that those kind of things worked was you would, um, you would be speaking by the spirit. And so you would have a text in front of you. So you'd have the Bible and you'd start off somewhere with it. And then, and then you would exhort from based on that and you would, and that could go on and on and on, you know, but probably not with, in a lot of cases with a lot of notes. Um, and so actually, um, um, you know, several, so like a lot of the different parts of the restoration movement, they don't like it to have a, a pre-written prayer, right? So in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Utah, they, they won't, I think, usually ever do pre-written prayer, except for the communion prayers, the sacrament prayers, um, or, you know, like a special prayer like that, maybe, but in general, they don't. Um, and, but whereas in the, as you know, in the, um, in the Church of Jesus Christ, you know, in the headquarters of Monongahela, the uh, descendants from the Rigdon group, um, that they won't do pre-written talks, right? And so they, um, so they do all their sermons and and talks and so on, also from the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so this would have been more like that, you know. And so I always though say those guys um, um, preserve a a really cool Kirtland era style restoration church because they are more focused on some of these. Um, uh, ecstatic gifts of the spirit. So they're going to be more likely to speak in tongues and, and those kind of things, I think, in the church of Jesus Christ than what they don't do that in the Utah church or really in our church anymore, um, in community of Christ. But they will also, um, they also do this thing of, of a, um, of doing the whole service kind of from the spirit. And they would have been doing more like that in, in, uh, this, if you were visiting in Kirtland in the 1830s or something like that. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I've, I've attended a handful of Church of Jesus Christ services. Uh, not even, they don't even plan the songs they're going to be sung. Somebody yeah, calls yeah. Calls out a hymn number. Um, <laughs> I, I just thoroughly enjoy their services. That you, their three-hour services feel like they're 45 minutes long. They're just, yeah, they're yeah. just awesome. And I tell people, that's an April 6th, 1830 church. If you want to go in there, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where. Yeah, no, it, be, it was very, I think, that, I think that you get the experience of what it would have been like in early Kirtland by going and visiting the Church of Jesus Christ. You do not get it by going to Community of Christ or by <laughs> going to the LDS Church. The LDS Church, unfortunately, um, has, has, I think, perfected uh, uh, a type of service that is, is not interesting to be at. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to be mean about it, but it's very, anyway, in any event. So it's very different than what you get in the Church of Jesus Christ, so. Yeah, and, and this is part of the thing too, folks, is, you know, I, I'm why am I talking about Sidney Reagan so much? Well, one, because he's an undertold story. He was yes. a very important person, and actually he m merits this time to, to discuss his part that he played in this, in the, really the early days, but really he was an important player throughout this whole entire process. And, 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 and a lot of people forget about him because he lost out to Brigham and we'll, yes. talk, we'll talk about that in our third segment. But, um, but it's important that we have these conversations to talk about and maybe undertold stories within the history of the restoration because so often, and I'm not faulting the church, the church has to come up with a historical narrative. They, they wanna kind of give their best, you know, uh, give their best face. But a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of folks within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they're only given that sanitized version of history. 
And I think it's important that you read the official church stuff, but also, you know, explore other avenues so then you get a fuller picture of the historical, uh, early historical period. And hopefully conversations like this will add to that as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot that goes on in this period of time. And we don't, we, we, this is really like, we're just doing a broad overview of this period of time. Um, maybe you could direct the conversation. Where would you, sure. what do you think is the next thing that we should be talking about as we go through this? Well, so one of the things that people tend to forget because they like to draw the map and the map will just say more or less um, New York, Kirtland, Missouri, Nauvoo, Salt Lake, <laughs> you know, or something like that. And so then they forget that this whole early period from um, 1831 to 18, you know, 37, it's not just the Kirtland period, it's simultaneously a Missouri period. Yes. So, um, and so once they, once, um, Joseph Smith and everybody relocate to Sidney Rigdon's headquarters and they establish church headquarters at Kirtland. Um, nevertheless, they still have already had this revelation about the Indians and so on, and that they've decided that the center place for the New Jerusalem, the, the imminent millennium that they all believe is going to happen within five years, essentially, um, that that is going to be in Independence, Missouri. And so, and so that's at the very edge of the American frontier for the European Americans, for the settlers. So it's really the farthest west place. It's right now, if you look at it, it's the center of the continent, it's the center of the United States. But back then it was the very edge of the frontier. And so they immediately establish a church newspaper there. That is the farthest west newspaper in the, in the United States. Um, they, uh, you know, immediately start to gather there uh, in Jackson County, Missouri. And one of the reasons why they gather there is that all of the people who are joining the church largely are, are poor. And um, Kirtland, and the way the American frontier works is anywhere that's settled, um, uh, the land is expensive because people have made farms. The farms are, uh, you know, are out of your price range if you don't already own property and so forth. But what's happened with the, with the American dream of the 19th century for the settlers anyway, is that the government is expropriating, stealing land from the Indians, and then it is, um, surveying it and so on. And so the dream is that every single person can go with the frontier, everyone the settler people, the white people can go and, uh, and buy 40 acres or say 80 acres for almost nothing from the government, uh, you know, make it into a farmland and create your own, your own, um, you know, your own farm. And so that's the initial American dream. And so when, um, when that's happening at the edge of Missouri, all of that land is there for the, uh, the taking the government's taken. And, and, and so now um, those people are able to settle there and gather there. So during this whole period, even though Joseph Smith and headquarters is, and city Rigdon are, and Kirtland, um, there's actually more members in Missouri. Uh, so the members are kind of gathering there. And the, the key thing is, is that we're also almost building like two separate organizations are established uh, yes. at the time. So maybe talk about the organization of, of what's going on there and who's in charge and kind of what, what direction they take things out in Missouri. Yeah, well, the first thing is that the Missouri part is also less stable. <laughs> And so one of the things that is happening is it's the frontier, right? And so and so it's more, if you think of kind of Wild Westy, um, the there's it's less civilized in the sense of there are less women out there. There are more, um, uh, you know, ornery, uh, <laughs> you know, cowboyish kind of guys out there. Um, as the as the church is is sending um, religious converts who are thinking that the end of the world is about to happen and that this is going to be uh, um, a new Jerusalem and this is the uh, where Christ is going to reign and so on. All of these whiskey swilling, you know, uh, people from, you know, that are from frontier folks or whatever, they're, you guys are all going to be, you know, they're, they're telling them constantly, you guys are all going to be burned up uh, and, and God is going to be here and he's going to give all this land to us and we're going to build a, you know, a new city of Jerusalem and so on. It doesn't take very long that the, the uh, old settlers, the, the frontier guys, do not like these people <laughs> who keep coming. You know? So they are not excited about you know, what they would call the Mormons, right? So in other words, so uh, this is a, a term. Nobody, nobody calls it the church, Church of Christ because there's too many churches of Christ. And they have this weird book, the Book of Mormon. And so Mormon is a name that sticks to you know, everybody in the movement ever thereafter. And so, and so the old settlers don't like these Mormons. And eventually they, um, at gunpoint, uh, have some battles and kick them out of the county, out of Jackson County, and dispossess them of everything. And they have to flee as refugees to, uh, across the Missouri River to, uh, to Clay County. 
Uh, and so, and so, and so then the ne next whole part of this period is trying to get your land, get, trying to get the land back in Jackson County and also trying to, um, trying to go back to Jackson County because Revelation has said that's where the new Jerusalem is going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, during this period of time, we're, uh, new, new, new scripture, uh, we have, you know, the, of course we had the book of commandments, which would later become the doctrine and covenants. Um, yeah. We, you know, scripture is being produced. Uh, they're retranslating the Bible. Maybe talk a little bit about some of the scripture that is uh, is is coming forth during this period of time as well. Well, um, so so there is a lot more of it in this time period. So Joseph Smith, um, directly out of the Book of Mormon revelatory experience of of um, of dictating the text of the Book of Mormon. Um, dictating what becomes these commandments in the Doctrine and Covenants in the Book of Commandments originally, um, is uh, the first one of those happens to kind of describe um, how do we get out of this problem that the lost 116 pages of the Book of Mormon, you know, and so there's like, they go and ask God about these things, and then there's a response that Joseph Smith channels, uh, thus saith the Lord, and so forth. Uh, and so, and so in a lot of the cases, um, these will be administrative even, <laughs> And so people will be called, you know, my servant, Sidney Rigdon, let him do this or that. Let my servant, Emma Smith, she is an elect lady, let her gather the um, hymnals and, uh, I'm sorry, gather hymns for my, uh, my church. That's, that my, whatever, I, don't, I can't quote it directly, but anyway, whatever it says, you know, a lot of times it's quite administrative, um, calling people to do different functions or to go on a mission to go somewhere or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so in general, it's those kind of things, or it would be... Um, you know, they're predictive so the end of the world is coming it's time to you know get you know it's a time to announce uh you know the time is ripe you know the field is white ready to harvest as we kind of gather together at the last days here the latter days um those those sorts of ideas you know it's time to um you know it would be questions like um you, you we've asked where is the new jerusalem going to be you know it turns out that it's in a <laughs> it's in jackson county at a place at a spot not far from the courthouse you know the place right now where community of christ temple and world headquarters are is that spot which is in that um those early revelations that they decided to that that was going to be where their the the center of their zionic community is going to be uh and so the, the revelation is answering things like that yeah yeah and of course at this time we of course we encountered the uh, mummies for Michael Chandler, and so then yep, we, get yep. the, we get the whole Book of Abraham thing rolling, and um, he starts the process of translation and all that uh, during this period of time. And there's just so much going on. And you stop and think about it. here we are. They're building a community. They're building a temple, and then they're also starting a chart. Try to charter a bank. I mean, just talk <laughs> about the logistics of starting a community like this, and then kind of mm -hmm. talk about where it kind of starts to spiral a little bit as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so there is a lot that 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 um, is problematic. So they um, so they're, the major uh, problem that they're having out in Missouri, um, you know, also is is causing problems everywhere, right? And so the fact that they've um, that the, they're trying to gather to Missouri, but they've been kicked out of Jackson County. They're living as kind of refugees in Clay County. Um, this is causing um, everybody in the church to be kind of upset, uh, and certainly a lot of suffering for the people, the members that are in Missouri. And so at a certain point, um, uh, they try to uh, fix that by um, taking a, actually an armed camp. So they think they've, they've tried, every, they've exhausted every legal possibility, they think. And so they arm a militia that is going to march uh, from Kirtland to all the way to Missouri, um, you know, my great, 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 great grandfather is one of the captains of this camp His uh, his son is the youngest of the of the men who are under arms and who illegally march uh, across state lines as a illegal militia to try to take, uh, you know, to recapture their lands in Jackson County by force. And when that happens, they, um, they, they've decided they're no longer going to take this being called Mormons by everybody. <laughs> and so they changed the name of the church from Church of Christ to Church of the Latter-day Saints. Okay. And then they march kind of under this banner piece and they march whatever it is, 800 miles uh, to try to do that. When they get, they, they, the fact that this is happening causes some panic in Missouri until such a time as, it, as, as it's kind of realized how just grossly outnumbered the, um, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints militia would be. So they get to Missouri and then um, 
rather than engage in, in a war where they would have been just totally decimated, there's a you know kind of a face saving revelation at the end that you know it's kind of a test and so forth, and we don't we're not actually going to do it, and so and so it doesn't actually come to a, an actual war in the end. But um, yeah, one of the things I just wanted to bring, you know, I, for whatever reason, um, in Rough Stone Rolling, his story of telling about Zion's camp and all that, I, I always found that to be very and a very interesting and well-written telling of that group. I was just wondering, do you have any other books that you would recommend that also talk about science camp and all that they encounter? Um, there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole book on science camp. I, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'd have to look it up to what, I, okay. what I would give you. I mean, there's a book back here that's on it, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll look it up for that you can have maybe for your comments later. Yeah, for show notes or something. Yeah, we could put yeah. that in there because yeah. I just find that to be, I, for whatever reason, it really stuck out in Rough Stone Rolling. I thought he did a good yeah. job telling the story, but I, I I just wondered if there was a, some other good materials out there. So we'll put that in the show notes, folks. And yeah, talk. from our perspective in Community of Christ, this is an, this is an example of where the church now starts to go off course. Okay. And well, so, and so, when you decide to take up arms and uh, and settle things uh, uh, militarily, um, this is this is a place where the church went astray. Hmm. And so, we don't look at upon Zion's camp in that kind of a, a positive way. We hmm. think of this as a as, as a, an, a place where the church, the early church, fell into error. Hmm. And so, uh, but one of the things that did happen, so in other words, it didn't really accomplish anything, um, but one of the things that actually did happen is all of these people who went on this thing and had experienced all of these failed prophecies, you know, and so one of the things, when you have, what happens when prophecy fails? Yeah. Um, and, and so it's like with the Millerites who are contemporary here, who ultimately, you know, become the Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses come out of these movement and everything like that, just because Miller prophesies that the world, end of the world is absolutely going to happen in 1844 or whatever it is. Um, the fact that there's a great disappointment, the prophecy totally fails. That doesn't matter. That doesn't mean there's no Adventists today. There's plenty of them, you know, because actually what happens is half the people leave. Yeah. But the other people who don't leave um, are stronger in the movement once they, once they have rationalized how they understand the prophecy didn't fail, even though it did. Mm -hmm. And so for all of the people who went on Zion's camp, who didn't leave the church as a result of it um, failing, uh, those people then now become the um, you know core kind of core loyalist leaders, and so and so all of the leaders in the camp become uh, get named to these new offices, which become the the uh, apostles, the presidents of seventy, the seventies, and uh, high councils. And so, for example, my great great grandfather, like I say, who was went on the camp, he becomes. Um, uh, a 70 and one of his uh, and he later is on the high council in far west and so forth because of um, being one of these loyalists who went on that march so again we're covering a lot here and i'm feeling like we need to start transitioning out of kirtland to missouri and then ultimately yeah. to nauvoo so maybe we could just yeah, let's, let's let's wrap kirtland up and then we'll get to missouri <laughs> yeah, yeah. so 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 in kirtland they were at, at this point then they they redoubled their efforts they finished building the temple and when they when they build the temple and dedicate the temple and have this amazing service, this is the moment when everybody can in the whole movement can look back on and see this amazing outpouring of the spirit. They built this magnificent house for the Lord. Uh, we sang together the spirit of God like a fire is burning. And we can all go back and, and anytime anybody wants to do that and we go into the Kirtland Temple and do that together, you cannot deny the outpouring of the spirit that you feel. I've had atheist friends who come to me and say, at the end of that, I felt the spirit. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you feel the spirit when you do that. It's amazing. Um, but it bankrupted them to build it. And so, uh, and so they decide that they're going to um, make a bank. They have no idea how to make a bank. Um, the same kind, Joseph Smith, you know, who, uh, you know, likes to predict stuff. He predicts a bunch of that the bank is going to go really well. The bank goes very poorly. Lots of people who had been on the Kirtland High Council and so on, all of the people who had property all lost all their property. Um, they ever, every, they, everybody goes bankrupt. Uh, Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith are um, essentially have to leave the state of Ohio for to get out get away from their to run away from their debts. Uh, and meanwhile, the church itself in Ohio is so mad that they um, expel them uh, from the church. The church reorganizes itself uh, and 
uh, has a new leader, uh, you know, it, it changes its name back to Church of Christ. Uh, they they get rid of, uh, you know, they denounce Sidney Rigdon and and, and uh, Joseph Smith and so on, and and that's you know they're 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 through with uh, uh, with Joseph Smith. Meanwhile, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon flee. They move to uh, to the Missouri Center. So as I said, there's already more members of the church in Missouri. Um, but what has happened is now in the interim, because that, that military venture failed, uh, the, they made, made a compromise with the state of Missouri. The state of Missouri created a county just for the Mormons, just for the Latter-day Saints, called Caldwell County. Uh, if the, as part of a, a deal, which is essentially, if you stay in this county, we'll give you a whole county, but don't bug us in our, our part of the rest of the state. And so then um, all of the problem is that all of the people who are the leaders of the Missouri church are kind of old disgruntled leaders who um who don't get along with joseph smith and Sidney rigdon <laughs> and so this is oliver cowdery and the whitmers and everybody like that in other words these and they have been kind of the leaders of the missouri church so now um when Sidney rigdon and joseph smith lose control of the ohio church they decide we've got to we got to take serious control we can't let this happen again so they go out there and they essentially immediately decapitate the leadership of the Missouri church. So they excommunicate the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery and so on. And they take direct control now of, uh, of the settlement there, far West Missouri, which is, um, which is also its own county. So they now have, they're now, they're no longer living in the settled part of the US. They're living in a very frontiersy zone in, in log cuts and whatever they can build. Uh, but they actually own their own county at that point. Hmm. Wow. It's so fascinating, just the, all the machinations that were going on and the intrigue, and you have this group left in Ohio, and then you get out there, and then there's this, uh, it's pretty amazing, just to, it's it's a drama of, uh, you know, just thinking about the history of the United States and this, the frontier, the, the story of Mormonism really is the story of America. It's uh, it's just a great, it's a great, I think that's why I find it so fascinating. So here we are in Missouri, and things obviously don't uh, go too well. Maybe no. we could talk a little bit about that. So it goes pretty fast off the rails. So um, so Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon have learned the wrong lesson, in my view, from what happened in Ohio. And so and so they've decided that they need to clamp down on everything. That they need to um, they need to make sure that they're fully in charge of everything, and that they need to. Um, they need to have arms again to make to defend themselves against their neighbors and so on. And so actually, because they have their own county, they can have their own legal county militia. Uh, and they do. But then they um, simultaneously, because they don't really know how to, what it is to run a county, and they don't really have any good advice and things like that. Simultaneously, um, a, a, a secret paramilitary organization is, uh, is, uh, organized by a member of the church named Samson Avard, uh, but it immediately has the blessing of Joseph Smith in the first presidency. And so he, uh, and so it's called the Danites. Uh, and so it becomes kind of an illegal militia that is right next to the, the legal militia. Um, um, one of the things that has happened is they decapitated the uh, church, Missouri church leadership, but those guys still own property in the county and they still live there. Uh, and so uh, the first presidency, um, you know, uh, essentially warns them out of of the town. So essentially, there's a uh, Sidney Rigdon preaches a uh, a sermon called the Salt Sermon, uh, uh, completely at the total approval of Joseph Smith, who also want, uh, get, decides that they want to publish it of all things. <laughs> so they get a lot. They're very. They're very. Uh, they're really on the wrong path. And so essentially, it's more or less. The, the 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 dissenters are called the um the the book of mormon witnesses frankly uh the whitmers and oliver cowdery and so on they need to get out of the county and uh or or they're going to be killed <laughs> is essentially the the gist of it and so they flee and so they flee and go to um uh ray county which is the county just south of caldwell county and now there becomes a a dissident ex uh mormon let's say community that is um, uh, talking about spreading rumors about anyway, and also with, with the Missourians who already, by the way, only had an uneasy truce with these guys to begin with. And so there's a lot of antagonistic Missourians already. Uh, and then the other thing that immediately happens is Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon decide, we're not going to stay in this county. 
we're going to immediately try to take over all the counties in northwestern uh, Missouri. And so they they make a settlement that's uh, at a place called DeWitt, which is at an important river fork between the Missouri River and this Grand River that goes up into the kind of northwest. They they make a new settlement in Davies County at a place that gets called Ottoman Diamond, so Diamond they call it. Um, and up there they um, uh, they try to seize control of that county, which is a brand new county uh, from the Missouri settlers and so on. Uh, and so everybody starts to freak out and panic. The Missourians uh, think that the Mormons are going crazy and are going to, you know, try to um, steal their whole state from them and so on. And so they call out their militias. Uh, uh, it, it, it escalates really fast. So a, a Missouri state militia uh, is kind of patrolling along the border of the Mormon county. Um, uh, when at, at a certain point, the rumors are that those guys are attacking more, the Mormons and stealing Mormon prisoners and so on. So the Mormons call out uh, their illegal militia, the Danites, uh, and they run down and actually cross the border and attack uh, the state militia and have a little battle. It's called the Battle of Crooked River. Uh, and so um, my great, great, great grandfather, again, I mentioned he is uh, one of the Danites. Mm. Um, and when, when David W. Patton, who is one of the uh, leading 12 apostles who's in that battle is, is brought wounded back away from the battle, he just comes to my, my grandparents and where he dies. Uh, and so anyway, that causes a much broader war to break out. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's one where the uh, Mormons are very outnumbered. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and just, you know, it's not only is it the Ameri the story of America, it's also the story of your family. That's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, one thing we can go back, you know, the idea was this, the idea of extermination. Now, of course, it was Rigdon that introduces that within the context of the SALT sermon, from my understanding. That's right. But also extermination has a different, uh, and we haven't talked about this, but from my understanding, extermination really meant more expulsion than killing. Is that, would that be a correct uh, yeah, term? Yeah, yeah. So when, 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 when so, so, um, so yeah, when they announced their independence on the 4th of July speech, which again, they publish and send to everybody. If, if anybody doesn't respect our rights, the church says, you know, then it'll be between us and them a war of extermination. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they got the word of ex extermination that they predicted and wanted, right? And so, and so later, um, once, the, once the actual um, illegal act of, let's say, crossing a county line with an illegal militia and attacking a, a, a state militia troops, once that happens, Things are things are not going to recover. Uh, it's not going to go good in, in any kind of easy way. So um, so from there, um, the state militias uh, or and mobs mobs kick the Mormons out of that settlement in Dewitt that I mentioned. So the Mormons essentially have to pull out of all of the kind of uh, settlements that are not in their own county and the county immediately north of them. And so when the county immediately north of them, in, in response for the other Mormons getting kicked out, they go up and they, um, they burn the county seat down to the ground of the county north of them, their illegal militia again, the Danites. And then they go around every, um, every non-Mormon settler's cabin and they burn that and kick them all out of the, their, their property. So they have to flee the county and they take all the property back and consecrate it to the bishop's storehouse. <laughs> And so it's a it's a real war at that point where you're burning down everybody's houses and towns and so forth, uh, and so that causes the uh, governor to call out. Uh, he 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 way over, um, you know, you know. So he he credits with the extermination order overcompensates. He calls out thousands of militia, and uh, there's just no way that's going to end well at that point. So. Yeah. So basically, I mean, at this point, this sets the table up everything. I mean, there's so many we can talk about the Hans Mill massacre. I mean, there's just so much stuff that goes on yeah, in here. Yeah. And there's some great there's some terrible, terrible things that happen. Uh, both sides do terrible things to each other, yeah. um, you know, and and it's just it's a really a tragic tale. But it also seems like so much of this was preventable. Just yes. You know, that's the sad thing about it. it it's kind of crazy because actually, yeah, if they had just settled the county, you know, that they, you know, and they, they would have been able probably to, um, you know, to establish themselves and have their own county, the, the county north of them probably would have eventually been a Mormon county too, you know, in other words, if they had just even had anything on the ground before they went nuts, you know, and so just a matter of it, just the, um, I just feel like Joseph Smith and Sidney Reagan were too, um, their uh, to their response was too aggressive to what happened to them in Kirtland, right? Mm -hmm. And so then when and so they weren't as we weren't as used to the what the compromises and what had been made to make the peace in Missouri, 
And so they immediately kind of unstate, made everything unstable and unbalanced it too fast. Uh, but in any event, yeah, then the, the next thing that happened is like you say, there's a, a massacre. So uh, what had been a militia unit became a mob. They, they attacked, uh, they had a battle of Hans Mill actually, they just killed everybody. Um, and then eventually the um, Mormons are all cordoned into far west, the, the county seat of their own county. And uh, they're surrounded by militia units. They could potentially, it could potentially just, they could be exterminated. In other words, that could end ended in a massacre at that point. Um, it doesn't end in a massacre because Joseph Smith decides to surrender. Um, and so, and so he gets surrendered. And so all of the leading um, uh, Mormons, anybody who's anybody gets, uh, gets put in jail and to be tried for treason and so forth. Um, they were initially tried to court martial him. The, one of the lawyers that is there, one of the generals, um, militia general says he won't fill, fulfill that order as an illegal order. So they're taken for actual trial instead of a, a military trial, a, a actual trial. Um, and so then, and then they, the state imposes, uh, now, now the state is going to be doing its worstest. <laughs> so, so despite the fact that there were, that there were errors on both sides and there were massacres and problems and things on both sides, nobody on the Missourian side is, is prosecuted for anything. Uh, and they, and they, um, expropriate illegally all of the property of every, all of the Mormons in order to pay for the militia and so on and so forth. And they expel everybody from the state. And so this is a moment when everybody who's not now arrested has to pick up and flee in the winter and leave as just destitute refugees uh, across the frozen Mississippi to get to a refuge in the, in the state of Illinois, you know? And so at that point, you know, this is not, it, uh, it goes from being, well, both sides were doing things wrong to the Missouri side <laughs> doing, doing stuff pretty wrong. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just, again, it was a different time and it's amazing. Uh, you know, this, there, the, these were very rough times. And, uh, and so basically uh, Joseph, he goes to jail um, you know, the, the saints are fleeing all across the border over into Illinois. Uh, Illinois actually was very receptive to receiving yes. them. They had a sympathetic uh, people that uh, didn't, they didn't really care for Missourians anyway. So they thought, no. Well. And, and so maybe just talk about the dynamic now of you have this group of people who are now making their way to another place, uh, a place that would be called a beautiful place, Nauvoo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're very poor, they're refugees. Now suddenly public opinion that had been kind of, uh, you know, quite anti-Mormon now swings way back in their favor because of this, this manifest injustice of having all your property stolen and so forth and, and fleeing as refugees. Like you say, the Illinoisans welcome, welcome them. Um, uh, Quincy is one of the places where everybody um, is, you know, is able to regroup and so on. Um, uh, um, and, and now they start looking for a place to have a new settlement. Um, uh, one of the things that is happening at all times is there are, there are land speculators and there are people who have um, tracts of land and, and they're trying to sell uh, plats of cities and so forth. And there's a failed uh, town uh, north of Quincy called Commerce. And the people who kind of own it, you know, are able to kind of convince the they're like, hey, there's a bunch of refugees. We got a bunch of land, and so they are able to, uh, you know, sell that land and 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 get it to uh, be the place where the new the new settlement is going to be. And like you say, that gets uh, eventually is named Nauvoo by Joseph Smith, um, taking from his um, he'd had a Hebrew school when they were in Kirtland, and so he had done some Bible study that also involved trying to learn Hebrew. And one of the um, uh, their understanding anyway of the, of the, from that, from their own kind of textbook is that Navu should be kind of a, an adjective that means beautiful in Hebrew and so forth is, is their understanding. Anyway. And so, uh, and so that's where the name of the town comes. They were initially maybe going to be on the Iowa side. Uh, Iowa is a territory there. And so on the Iowa side of the river, and that would have been a lot better. Um, they might've, they might, if I feel like if they had done that, um, uh, the churches, the restoration might still be headquartered in, in Lee County in Iowa, but, but they did not do that. Um, so they moved to a state that initially was very welcoming, uh, but um, at a certain point, um, unfortunately, when the Latter-day Saints gathered in big numbers, they would wear out their welcome pretty fast. And so anyway, so they, they do eventually do that at the end of this kind of period. Um, while Joseph Smith is in, uh, uh, in custody, um, these are, you know, obviously trying times for him. They're in, uh, you know, jails are not great conditions in, in uh, those times. There's every reason to believe that uh, he'll ultimately be executed for, um, you know, his part in the Missouri-Mormon War. 
Um, one of the things that's important for our part of the movement is, is that, uh, you know, when his, uh, his eldest son is visiting him in the jail, um, this is one of the places where he gave, uh, you know, prophetic blessing to him that he would one day be a prophet at the church, right? And so anyway, that is relevant anyway to the community of Christ for memory and understanding. Another thing that's relevant is that when Emma was kind of leading a troop of refugees and having to flee uh, across the river, you know, that she, um, you know, maintained possession of things like the Book of Mormon manuscript and especially the uh, inspired version manuscript, uh, you know, which was in sewn into the ladies, um, you know, her companions uh, dresses so that they wouldn't be uh, so wouldn't be stolen by the Missourians. And she herself had a testimony that uh, that that manuscript was um, uh, it was imp it was important. She one of the reasons she was saved because it was that manuscript was so important uh, and, and, and that therefore uh, that God wasn't going to let that, you know, uh, fall. <laughs> And so therefore, um, anyway, that was important to her. And so, yeah, they um, uh, eventually um, there, you know, they, they, after all of the different changes of venue and so on that happened for Joseph Smith's trial, eventually they get to a place where uh, they have a, they're able to bribe a jailer and he's able to flee the state. Uh, and so then he spends the rest of his life um, as a, um, a person who is fighting extradition uh, from Missouri. So Missouri still continues to want to try him um, but as you mentioned, the people in Illinois are not particularly, <laughs> they don't, they don't, they're, they're very initially very, um, uh, including the state government, they're initially very, very welcoming and, and, and are per, per happy to, um, thwart the Missouri and, uh, uh, different types of, uh, you know, extradition papers and so forth. <laughs> so dude, now we're, we're, we're deep in this and I want to, and again, this is an overview. I mean, there's so many we could talk about because now we're in the Nauvoo period and I guess, yeah. I'm going to have to go to you and say, listen, you got, you know, 10, 15 minutes to give me uh, the highlights or the <laughs> cliff notes of Nauvoo. I mean, I've yeah. got John Bennett's book here. We've got polygamy. We've yeah. got, I mean, we've got so much stuff that's going on. We got Masonic membership. We have, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, the then the building the actual city, the, the special charter that they have, which then the other communities like Warsaw resented. I mean, there's so much going on there. So I guess I, I because we're just doing an overview, 30,000 foot thing here, maybe 10,000. Um, if you maybe just talk about this period of time and the, how important this is to the entire restoration movement. Oh, yeah. Well, so so this is kind of their, you know, in Joseph Smith's lifetime, this is the last um, attempt to build, you know, a Zionic community. So they're building you know, even though it's not where they wanted to build it, they want to build it in Jackson County, Missouri, but they're going to build it now where they have to, which is to say on, on the banks of the Mississippi. And they create, um, you know, the, it, uh, one that on the outside, it seems very successful. So unlike when they had their own county in Missouri, and they didn't know how, what the, how powerful a county was in antebellum, <laughs> you know, in, in antebellum uh, U.S. government and so forth. Um, a county can already do a lot of the things that they have to get a special charter for their city to do um, in, in, in Illinois. But in Illinois, they immediately um, attract some people. Um, there's this whole big movement, you know, that is, that is very um, uh, well known now. And so that it, it attracts a bunch of, I don't know, rapscallions and so forth. And one of these is John C. Bennett, who is uh, has already, you know, kind of warmed his way to being the quartermaster general of the militia of Illinois. And so now he um, is able to be like, let's say, their advisor who is going to be able to get everything for the movement for Joseph Smith and the movement, you know, work through the, the state government in Springfield. And so as a result, like you say, they, they pass a special charter for Nauvoo that allows them to have their own courts and to have their own militia and so forth. And so now, um, you don't need to have Danites anymore because now they're going to have, you know, a, a legally incorporated uh, as part of the Illinois militia, their own Nauvoo Legion. Uh, and so, um, and so because again, Joseph Smith is always flexible in the same way that, you know, Sidney Rigdon had come in and been his new uh, best uh, uh, bud and had been his collaborator um, when, and displacing Oliver Cowdery. 
you know, Oliver Cowdery's totally gone. Now Sidney Rigdon is kind of scapegoated and is thought of that maybe he was the problem in Missouri. You know, he's, Joseph Smith was the problem in Missouri, <laughs> but that can't, that's not a good answer. So it's Sidney Rigdon. And so now Sidney Rigdon goes into, um, you know, he, he is no longer, his star is no longer in ascendance. And now uh, Joseph Smith's new best friend is John C. Bennett, who is uh, made mayor of Nauvoo. He's made, yeah, this is a great, um, yeah, this is a great yeah, So I just want to bring this to everybody's attention. Uh, this is uh, The Saintly Scoundrel, The Life and Times of Dr. John Cook Bennett. For those yeah. of you who want to know more about this very interesting fellow who was part of the restoration even quite a bit longer after. That's right. <laughs> now yeah. who, than people realize. Uh, I recommend this book. I'll provide a yeah, link it's to this. Fantastic. It's a fantastic book. Um, uh, and and so Bennett um, becomes mayor of Nauvoo. He is added to the first presidency of the church. He is one of the generals of the Nauvoo Legion. He is chancellor of the, uh, you know, the on paper university that they have <laughs> and so on. So, he, so it's not like uh, this is just, he is, he is Joseph Smith's best friend. <laughs> and, um, and also, you know, like you say, one of the things that happens is that, uh, is that he kind of is, He's one of the people who's who, who's a Mason who uh, and as they and they as they create their own Masonic lodge, um, and they introduce Masonry and he's brought up to the highest orders in Masonry just like Joseph Smith in a second and so uh, and so May, uh, because they had been when when the Book of Mormon is composed the Book of Mormon is actually anti Masonic but by the time they get to Nauvoo you know, they become Masons and uh, the and the stories and rituals in Masonry. Um, which include secrecy, you know, oaths of secrecy. Um, it was viewed that some of the problems that had happened in, in Missouri was, you know, was that people had broken their oaths of secrecy as Danites and so forth, and, and in some cases, turned state's evidence kind of thing. So the, the president of the 12 apostles and so forth admitted, look, we're doing illegal, horrible, illegal things here. We've, we've driven everybody out of Davies County. We've stolen all their property and so forth. I'm not going to be part of a church like this. That was viewed as like a disloyalty thing. And so now having kind of secrecy is uh, viewed as good. And so that is integrated into what becomes uh, the endowment, what becomes uh, ultimately um, uh, temple stuff in um, the LDS tradition. It's kingdom stuff in the Strangite tradition and so forth, you know, depending on how, um, uh, same thing with the Cutlerite tradition. So it depends on how people go back and remember it. Uh, but certainly all of that starts to evolve out of it. Um, and one of the things that has also happened is uh, Joseph Smith, who had been, um, whatever it had been before, in terms of whether he just simply had a, a wandering eye and had engaged in some affairs and things like that, as with family, Fanny Alger back in Kirtland and maybe um, maybe another one of the women in, in Missouri too, we don't know exactly. Now he organizes an actual system of spiritual wifery um, that uh, Bennett is his key collaborator in initially. Uh, and, then, um, and then later when, when Bennett be becomes a scapegoat for that and when they have kind of a public break and everything like that, uh, then it's later uh, understood to be the system of celestial marriage or plural marriage. Essentially, the doctrine in Utah that you know families could be together forever that means polygamy, <laughs> as there's no there's no no separation between um, that that doctrine. Yeah, I mean, so and of course we haven't even talked about polygamy, and of course it's part of the narrative as well. Um, maybe we could touch a little bit on that because you know it's it's discussed so frequently. I don't see that we need to get too deep into it, but but we know that polygamy in many people's minds, that was the ultimate undoing of the whole thing yes. that led to the martyrdom. So the two the two things that are the undoing of the whole thing are are, like you say, this kind of um, Joseph Smith establishing this kind of secret practice of polygamy, uh, where um, where he's taking uh, additional spiritual wives. It is not the way that polygamy works in Utah later because they're actually, living in, in, you know, like households that where, where the husband is supporting people and things like that. Um, it is, uh, but, it, you know, just because I say spiritual wifery, that doesn't mean there's no physical component to that. Uh, there is, it's just, there's no, there's no, uh, let's say legal upkeep or anything like that that's happening. Um, that, that these wives include teenage girls, these wives include people who are women who are already married to other men and so forth. Um, it's a, it's a mess and a problem, and that certainly is one of the scandals that is um, uh, uh, that is bringing helping bring down the church in Nauvoo. 
Uh, but the other one that's probably just as equally bad and probably actually more damaging is, um, is stealing and uh, no recourse in the courts. So people are scandalized by polygamy, but they but property is the, is the basis of civilization. And so if you have, um, in the case, maybe stealing companies that maybe like take somebody's horse, bring it back to Nauvoo, uh, you know, give it to a Mormon, the person comes and says, that's my horse. Uh, and then they, 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 what happens is, is that if you bring a, if you bring a sheriff with you, um, they immediately get a writ of habeas corpus that brings them back to the Nauvoo courts. The court is, uh, the question is, has to be held, done in Nauvoo. A, a jury of Mormons immediately says, no, that's his horse, and, and you can't get your property back. And so people, people don't, um, uh, that leads to war. <laughs> so, you know, so property is a thing, you know, so between the scandal and between um, people feeling that they, their property wasn't safe and so forth, that they were gonna, you know, uh, uh, that ultimately causes a, 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 you know, it causes a showdown that is gonna end with uh, war. And it ends up, ends up being, uh, the, it ends up happening that Joseph Smith eventually is again uh, arrested. Um, and, it, and, and while he's held in custody by Illinois officials, he is uh, assassinated by a mob. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, The Kingdom of Nauvoo by Ben Park. Uh, that's a good book. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And I've talked to Ben at some point. He'll be coming on the program. I had Brian Stutzman come on and talk about the history of Warsaw, Illinois. Oh, yeah, um, neat. Th that's another interesting book for your collections. I like to try to bring in books into it, being that's in the title. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so this is the thing, you know, uh, it's... It's, it's all a great tragedy in some sense. And I'm speaking as an evangelical outsider. I don't have any dog in this fight or anything like that. I just love the history and I love the people. And, and you know what? There's qualities about Joseph Smith that I found I find admirable. Uh, you know, and even like Brigham Young, I find admirable qualities in many of these people. They're, they're flawed people. Uh, but King David was flawed. I mean, you know, I mean, we, the reality sure. is, you know, flawed, flawed men especially is just uh, par for the course throughout history. Um, the legacy of Joseph Smith at this point, so now the story, at we're we're at the point now where the prophet is he's killed, he's martyred. Yes. Um, let's just kind of do a retrospective now of Joseph Smith, the beginning of this church, till his martyrdom. What's the legacy of Joseph Smith, uh, and what role he plays in American history as well as in religious history? Well, um, I think that he ends up creating a very uh, mixed legacy and a mixed bag legacy. So I think that there were very um, positive innovations that he was doing that uh, have informed our movement and is still vital and um, meaningful in community of Christ today. So the, um, the I, things that we still hold onto that, from that era that um, uh, are things like we're not creedal, we are. Um, we have a principle of continuing revelation. Um, one of the things that existed in the and the idea of the of the church at that time initially is by that everything is done by common consent, um, and so there are these components of um, the early church, and including um, what Joseph Smith directly is doing by uh, by challenging, um, let's say scriptural authoritarianism where you uh you know where you have a some kind of a textual interpretation of the bible in which says may say something that's really wrong or uncomfortable but you feel like you got to do it well joseph smith gets his sharpie out and actually crosses that out and replaces in the bible what you know in the inspired version it says something else so it doesn't say um you know god hardened pharaoh's heart that he would not let the people go pharaoh hardens his own heart in in the inspired version and so on. You know, it doesn't say, um, as we say, the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't say, uh, lead us not into temptation. It doesn't pray praying God, for God not to lead us so that God doesn't lead us into temptation. In our version of the, of the Lord's Prayer, we say, suffer us not to be led into temptation. Um, anyway, so in other words, we, uh, I think that those are, are very positive things in his legacy. Um, but I think there's no... Uh, no denying that in the end, when he has, um, uh, he's, he's ceased to have strong voices around him who were able to tell him 
you should not do that. <laughs> you know, in other words, these people are gone. And instead, there are yes men and flatterers uh, like John C. Bennett or Brigham Young or whoever who are who are willing to who, whose creed, as they even say, are, are, you know, are Joseph Smith right or wrong. And, and as a result of that, he has he ends up losing um, uh, it, it, his judgment in terms of being able to have good good counsel and to choose between right and wrong and so forth. And so he definitely um, falls into uh, abuses and has and has abuses uh, that you can't deny. So he um, at some point or other, go ahead to my I mentioned my great 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 grandparents. At some point or other, he went to them and said. Yes, there's a idea he has of sealing in the eternities, and if you were to be, if your family, my family, were to be sealed into uh, Joseph Smith's family, into this royal princely household in the eternities, that's going to that's going to you know make sure that we are in the highest degrees of the you know of celestial glory. And the way that can be accomplished is that um, your 14 year old daughter Nancy Mariah Winchester now needs to be sealed to me as my wife and. My great 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 grandparents gave her, <laughs> gave you know the to him. That's an abuse of power, um, and I don't know. You can't. I don't think it could be justified. So so yeah, that's what I. Uh, so I think that as a result, his legacy is certainly mixed because of that. Because there were some good things, but then unfortunately, uh, uh, at the end, he's out of control and uh, doesn't know where his boundaries are. He loses track of that and. And there was no way it was going to end well. So somehow he was going to, it was going to result in his death, I think. Oh, this is great. Uh, you know, I was about 30 minutes into this thing. I'm like, oh boy, we're still in uh, Kirtland, Ohio. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and, and I'm so glad you, you're, you're joining me for to doing these because I think this is, you know, I was telling you off camera beforehand how I have a lot of LDS folk that watch the show from a progressive as well as a conservative perspective, but I'm getting a growing evangelical uh, actually, some Lutherans are starting to watch my program now um, that are, this is a good education to get the, the basic understandings of this period of time. Now, before we, I, I want to actually ask you a couple of questions about you, um, but this period of time from 1830 to 1844, this is a long period. Is there anything that you feel that we need to cover or, or psych, uh, just go back to that you feel that is important and needs to be addressed? Well, so... So from our perspective, as we look back on it, we, we like to think, see this, um, to learn from the lessons of our ancestors and who um, were involved in this. And so we kind of feel that when the church um, decided to be militant, when it would take up arms against neighbors, when it, when it decided to think of everything as very us versus them, you know, when we, when we started saying, calling ourselves the saints and calling everybody else the Gentiles, what we what we kind of failed, and when we failed to understand is some of those Gentiles were these wonderful Illinoisans who brought us in as refugees, but some of those Gentiles were you know rotten people who were you know who were attacking and and so on and trying to cheat us or something like that, and so and so but once you glump them all together as the other, you only think the worst of them and the bad the bad parts right and so and so when that happens, um, um, we lost track of. Uh, you know, being part of a church which is restoring Christ's gospel, where Christ is the Prince of Peace, right? And so, um, so it's been very critical um, for Community of Christ um, to to look at our uh, how we emerged and our own experience with tragedy in terms of our own losses, but also when we also. Um, we're not generous with our neighbors in, in, in ways so that we can, to, so that informs our movement to become, um, you know, more of a peace church. And so our seal on it always, you know, is emblazoned with the one word peace um, and um, promoting peace on earth and all, is one of our mission initiatives and, and, uh, and peace, uh, pursuit of peace is also one of our enduring principles. And so it's a very serious focus. The temple in independence is dedicated to peace. And, uh, and so in part that is informed by um, the errors um, our ancestors had in, 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 in taking up arms and, and being militant. Well, thank you, thank you, John. You know, I just real quick, uh, as we wrap things up, you know, this fall is gonna be the 50th anniversary of the John Whitner Historical Association. And you yes. are a past president of, the, of that organization. I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about that organization and uh, just also what it was like to be the president of that organization. 
Yeah, so the John Whitmer Historical Association is essentially the community of Christ or Midwestern variant of the Mormon History Association, you know, and so they were founded at similar times. Mormon History Association is a little older, um, but like you say, it's uh, 50 years old now, so they're both about that same age. And um, and specifically, uh, the study is of, um, it's of the whole movement, and of course, it's a lot of people, we all focus on these same 14 years that we just covered in an hour and a half, right? And so there's been so much written on that kind of time period. And, and certainly the John Whitmer Association also, you know, has some focus on that too. Uh, but one of the things that we also then focus on is then community of Christ history after 1844. And then also though history is of all of the um, restoration tradition churches, specifically other than the LDS church, because the Mormon History Association is really quite focused on the Brighamite tradition often anyway. I mean, they, they focus on anything too, but, but that is really kind of a specific focus of the uh, John Whitmer history, uh, Historical Association. And so no, it was absolutely a, a, a joy to be able to have been uh, president of the association. I've had so many great friends who are historians who I've um, known, who, you know, I've worked with on the board and, you know, worked with and through, uh, you know, helped put conferences together and so on and so forth. And so it just was, um, uh, John Whitmer is one of the ways, way, how I was able to have uh, as a mentor, Jan Ships. I mean, I got, I've been so close with Jan Ships in my life and it's became entirely, I met her at John Whitmer and uh, uh, she said, when I met her, she said, I am Jan Ships and I am president of this association. <laughs> and I've got, I mean, I'm the, she was the incoming president, president elect or whatever at the time. And she says, I would love to have you be on my program committee. And so that's how, anyway, that's how I got involved. And I just had so many great experiences like that. I'm looking for my Jan Ships book here. I don't see it on my bookshelf. Uh, uh, yeah, great. Oh, that's, that's great. I just love hearing these stories. I think it's so important people hear about these things. I just wanted to say uh, my my homies from the Outer Brightness podcast sent me this really cool mug. I told them, I said, you, you, you send me some merch and I'll, I'll promote you. The reason I bring this up is that both of them are former LDS, both return missionaries, and they both become... Uh -huh. um, uh, I was a guest on their program last year. The one is uh, a Campbellite. And the oh, okay. other is uh, actually came this close to be joining the community of Christ and primarily because of you. And oh, okay. uh, he came this close. He ended up becoming a Reformed Baptist. What is a Reformed Baptist? Well, they're, they're Reformed Calvinist types, but they believe in adult baptism. Um, oh, okay. Check out their podcast, folks. It's called The Outer Brightness. Uh, and they're both big fans. Paul and Matt uh, are both big fans of yours and, and your cool. work. So I just wanted to give them a cool shout out. So, uh, John, thanks again for coming back onto my program. Oh, I enjoy it so much, Stephen. <laughs> it's so much fun to do. This is a great program. Yeah, this is, I'm having a blast, dude. And this is great. And I'm so glad that you're, you've taken the time. I'm really, I was telling the minister in your church earlier today, I said, it's a real privilege that John's taking his time to do that. So I just want to thank you so much, John, uh, really for coming onto the program. Um, I think these are important episodes we're filming because, uh, you know, so often because we get into the partisan warfare of if I'm a member of a particular group and you're a member of a particular group, and it's like, rah, rah, rah. And, and here I am just as a Christian, uh, as an outsider who just says, let's just talk and have these conversations. This is an opportunity for bridge building, talking to each other and show that you can have different views, but still have civil conversations which I think is so important right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Awesome, dude. So I just want to remind my audience to like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit to the uh, bell to be informed when a new episode comes out. We're on all, on a major platform, sir, podcast. Hopefully we'll get this one on the podcast format soon. Anthony's working on that. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, you can reach me at uh, mormonbookreviews at gmail.com. Also, I want to thank all my Patreons who are financially supporting the channel. If you're interested, I'm going to leave a link. Uh, I do like incre increments of $5, 10 and $15. Um, and again, uh, thanks again for coming on, dude. And we'll be talking very soon. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.